Hello, brethren. I'd like to discuss today, if I may, uh, the purpose of unleavened bread. Why does the Feast of Unleavened Bread mean? What does that mean for Christians? Central to our understanding of the biblical Feast of Unleavened Bread is the realization that the resurrected Jesus Christ lives his life in every individual Christian. In our struggles against sin throughout the entirety of our lives, we can choose to fight on our own strength or we can surrender our will to God and rely on the risen Christ who lives his life in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Growing numbers of Christians around the world are discovering and celebrating the biblical feast outlined in Leviticus 23. And by looking at the symbolism associated with these days, they are coming to view them in light of the life and mission of Jesus Christ. After all, Christ himself, uh, he commenced the acting out of the plan of salvation by becoming our sacrificial lamb. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. You don't have to turn there, but you can put it in your notes if you want. It said, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And you can compare that to Isaiah 53, 7 through 9, and 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. Uh, Jesus started his church on another of these festivals, the Feast of Pentecost. And uh, Acts chapter 2, you can read about that. He must have considered them important. Uh, during the spring of the year, March, April, in the Northern Hemisphere, immediately after Passover and weeks before the Feast of Pentecost, falls another biblical feast, the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. And that's found in Leviticus 23, 6 through 8, Exodus 12, 17 through 18. Um, we're going to take a brief look at the greatest event that ever taken place during this feast and what it means for Christians today. Some might say that the exodus from the slavery of Egypt, which also took place immediately after Passover during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, number 33-3, was the greatest event to ever happen during the Spring Festival. Others might view the crossing of the Red Sea, which is traditionally assigned to the last day of Unleavened Bread, as another of the great festival events. This crossing signified that Israel was, at long last, finally free from Egyptian domination. Freedom was then a reality. Later, after Israel entered the Promised Land, the miraculous conquest of Jericho apparently took place over the seven days of the same feast. Other great unleavened bread events involved rededicating of the people of God to their creator. Two examples are recorded in 2 Chronicles, chapter 29 through 31, describe the return to godly worship led by King Hezekiah. In chapters 34 and 35, excuse me, tell of another under King Hosea. These chapters reveal the tremendous excitement and joy God's people felt as they recommitted themselves to him. Second Chronicles 30, 21 through 23 and 35, 17 through 18. You can read all about that. You can jot that down in your notes. But one other event that took place during the days of unleavened bread is much greater in its ultimate impact than any of these wonderful events. That event is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
We know that Jesus was crucified on the day before the Sabbath, as John 19, 31 tells us. While most people assumed that the Sabbath mentioned here was the regular weekly Sabbath day, observed Friday sunset and Saturday sunset, John plainly tells us that this particular Sabbath was a high day, a term used for the seven annual holy days that were part of God's festivals. A careful reading of the gospel shows that this high day was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a holy day, Leviticus 23, 2, 6 through 7. That can fall on a weekday. Jesus remained in the grave for three days and three nights, just as he had promised in Matthew 12, 40. Uh, it is impossible to reconcile Jesus' statement in Matthew 12 with the idea of a Friday afternoon crucifixion followed by a Sunday morning resurrection. Three days and three nights from, from the time of his entombment, just before the beginning of the first holy day of unleavened bread, brings us to near sunset, ending the weekly Sabbath. Still during the seven-day feast of unleavened bread, as the time when Jesus was, rector, was resurrected. <clears throat> Excuse me. In actuality, there was no Sunday morning resurrection. No matter how you look at it, it doesn't, doesn't happen that way. It happened the afternoon before, but on that Sunday, it was made known and word spread quickly that the tomb was empty and that he had appeared first to Mary Magdalene. And you can find that in John 20, 11 through 18. And then he appeared to other followers. Uh, 500, I think it was more than that too. Now, if we were followers of Jesus in Jerusalem at that time of his crucifixion, and then were told that he had been resurrected, what would be the topic of our conversation for the rest of the spring festival? What would be in your thoughts? I know in my thoughts, I would be thinking about the greatest event to have ever taken place in the history of humanity. The very statement of the angel, he is risen. Matthew 28, 6 through 7. These days of unleavened bread marked a turning point in the way the spring festival was to be celebrated down through the ages. Yes, Christians would still recall the Exodus, the coming out of Egypt as a type of redemption from sin and release from the bondage of Satan. There would still be an emphasis on eating unleavened bread as a physical reminder that we are to become spiritually unleavened by removing sin from our lives. We remove unleavened, we remove, let's try that again, I'm sorry. We remove leavening and leavened products from our homes. That is symbolic in that we are constantly removing leavening from our lives, which is symbolic for sin. But at the very center of it all, at the very core of the meaning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread <clears throat> is the all-encompassing truth that the resurrected Jesus Christ, the one who was raised during the spring festival, now lives his life in every individual Christian. Jesus repeatedly emphasized the importance of his own resurrection. During the Last Supper, he told the disciples that he would soon be betrayed. But he also told them that he would live again. He said, because I live, you will live also. And he was talking about in the future, in a future resurrection. John 14, 19. He had just promised them that Christians will not be left as orphans. Verse 18. That is spiritually unprotected and 
you're totally vulnerable to the power of Satan. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, you think about it, that goes all the way back to prophesied, Genesis 3.15. He stated that both the Father and He would live in the hearts and minds of Christians by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Verses 20 through 26. Since the resurrected Jesus Christ now lives in us, we are given the strength to conquer our sins. This new life, now made possible by the living Christ, empowers us to overcome the sin which so easily ensnares us. Hebrews 12, 1. What is the symbolism of unleavened bread? Well, part of God's instruction for the days of unleavened bread is to put leavened bread products out of our homes. I just mentioned that. You can find that in Exodus 12, 15 through 16. The Apostle Paul <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 5, 8 encouraged the mostly Gentile church there to keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, that lingering, sinful attitudes is what that means but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. A clear reference to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Paul recognized that the unleavened bread of this feast is symbolic of sincerity and truth. And brethren, that should be hallmarks of life of every Christian. And Paul also understood that leaven during this time symbolized sin as I mentioned earlier, and this feast pictures our need to make every effort to eliminate it completely from our lives. The truly great story about the days of unleavened bread is the story of the resurrected Christ living his life in us. And those of us who have truly repented of living in sin and have received God's Holy Spirit. This empowers us to overcome sins in a way that previously was simply not possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a festival that helps us to focus on replacing sin with righteousness. But the only real way to put sin out of our lives is to put Jesus Christ into our lives on a daily basis. And we do that through the washing of the water by the word, Bible study, and connecting with God and Jesus Christ every day through prayer. I pray the first thing when I get up in the morning. We are promised that we can truly put sin out of our lives because Jesus Christ lives within us. Uh, compare that with Galatians 2.20, Romans 7.23, and 8 through and 8.4. Now, what does it take to overcome sin? Paul tells us in Romans 13.12. We are to put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. He then lists the deeds of darkness as sin such as revelry, drunkenness, lewdness, lust, strife, and envy. And then in verse 14, he shows a way to conquer such sins by being clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ. In our struggles against sin, not only during the days of unleavened bread, but throughout the entirety of our lives. We can choose to fight on our own strength, or we can surrender our will to God and rely on the risen Christ who lives his life in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Minds of, uh, reminds me of Pentecost too. And with this kind of power working against our sins, the very power of his resurrection, Philippians 3.10, 
we can say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13, you read about that. <clears throat> we can struggle all along or we can rely on the power of the only one who never once sinned, Jesus Christ. He tells each of us as sinners, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. He encourages us to place our yokes and burdens on his powerful shoulders to find spiritual rest, saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He promises that his faithful followers will never perish, nor will anyone be able to take them from his hand because it is he who gives eternal life. John 10, 27, 28. You can make a note of that. We follow his instructions by coming to him so that we may have life. John 5, 40. Paul reminded Christians to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You might want to jot down Philippians 2.12. Yet, he was in no way preaching a works-based salvation. For the next verse, he explains that it is God who works in you both to will. That is, to have the desire to overcome. And to do, and that is to act on that desire for his good pleasure. Verse 13. Embedded in the meaning of the days of unleavened bread is the belief that central to come out of sin is the realization that the resurrected Jesus Christ lives his life in each one of us through the dwelling of his Holy Spirit. Indeed, as Paul also said, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And he further stated, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. For Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The faith that we have in God, that is a gift from God. And it is an all, it is all an operation of the grace of God. Galatians 2.20, it is the, re the resurrection of Christ and his living again in Christians to empower them and us to remove the leaven of sin from our lives. That gives these spring festivals, the Passover, the Festival of Unleavened Bread, and Pentecost, such a deep and lasting meaning, brethren. Isn't it time you look more deeply into the meaning of these biblical festivals and what they teach us about the life and mission of Jesus Christ? So until next time, brethren, thank you for listening. And may I say, good day to you.